Um, I'm Amanda Glassman. I'm the Chief Operating Officer and a Senior Fellow here at the Center for Global Development. Um, as the World Health Assembly kicks off next week in Geneva, there's lots on the agenda, and we're really pleased to host this curtain raiser event to discuss what's on the agenda, uh, what are the big issues, and what should we should look out for. Um, one big topic, of course, is the global program of work to be approved by the World Health Assembly. It's structured around three interconnected priorities, and I think it's useful because it's a list of three things that most people can remember. And that is different from previous GPWs. So those three, achieving universal health coverage, addressing health emergencies, and promoting healthier populations. Those are very big buckets. What's inside? So first, UHC. Uh, that's a very lofty goal. And I guess one of the big questions that comes to mind immediately is how that lofty goal of universal health coverage fits with an external funding uh, apparatus in low-income countries that remains quite stovepipe according to specific diseases and outcomes or advocates for every disease or product as a top priority. And there's still very limited space, although growing space, for public spending on health in countries. How are countries to balance? How will progress be measured? There's a metrics agenda alongside the global program of work. What incentives will that measurement strategy create? I would just pause for a moment to reflect a little bit on how we might use budgets in a way that would best support priorities. So one uh, very promising new move by the WHO uh, is that they are charged to develop and share practices on how to use cost effectiveness analysis, evidence, health technology assessment to select products for national use. That's an area that we have worked on for a long time. We hope that that kind of thinking will play into the essential medicines list and the development of guidelines, which are part of the big business of the WHO. But to date, the EML and the guidelines are not always consistent. Um, for example, the hepatitis guidelines have medicines on them that are not on the essential medicines list. How do we acknowledge the different starting points of countries in terms of resources and capacities to fund UHC? So even in the guidance, the core guidance, the WHO spends a lot of time working on, how are we fitting that with that UHC goal? Are we helping or are we hurting? How does that UHC vision fit with the reality of the external funding? And what is the role of the World Health Organization in aligning and coordinating external funders without many tools, really with, with the, um, the mandate uh, to oversee help this big vision. Um, but it's, it's tough because at the country level, obviously, each of those decision-making and resource allocation processes are happening outside of the WHO. And how does the UHC vision even fit with the reality of the intensely competing demands on scarce public budgets in middle-income countries? And how can WHO serve those two kinds of populations? We're really lucky that James Fitzgerald from the Pan American Health Organization is with us today and he'll be reflecting on, on that challenge. Um, let's talk about health emergencies for a moment. So we all know about the Ebola outbreak in DRC that has already claimed 18 lives and that scientists suspect has been spreading since much earlier in the year. WHO's Contingency Fund for Emergencies, it has $50 million in the bank. They've released money. We have some technologies in place. The World Health Assembly has an agenda item uh, two agenda items, one on progress in implementing the international health regulations, and the other, uh, the report of the Independent Oversight and Advisory Committee for the WHO Health Emergencies Program. All of these note progress, but highlight that WHO corporate systems and procedures are a major constraint on emergency operations. So just the way that they're doing business. The World Health, the WHO Health Emergency Programs is still only 45% funded for the 2018-19 biennium. Um, and the IHR compliance reports seem to show that multiple needs and progress assessments are still out there. So it's not just the global health security agenda and the joint external evaluation, but there's many progress. There's ad hoc surveys, et cetera. But what I don't still feel that we have is a clear, objective, and comparable sense of where different countries stand on preparedness and how much would it cost to get them uh, to a higher level of preparedness. Also in good news this week, there's no wild polio virus, but now a very imminent risk of scaling down the global polio eradication initiative. 
um, the largest communicable disease surveillance program in the world, a funder of approximately 80% of vaccination staff in Sub-Saharan Africa and about 40% of the staff of WHO Afro. The polio transition plan is on the agenda. There's a price tag for transition. It's $268 million if I do not um, uh, misremember. But I guess the question is, how is it going to work? Um, and how does it fit with the other global health emergencies work? Can't we use that existing setup that's been put together for polio and repurpose it for global health security? It's also worth noting that the largest chunk of the WHO's 2018-2019 budget is polio, 35% of total. What happens if that disappears? Healthier populations. Um, there's lots to discuss here, but I'll just mention uh, this goal in the context of the two high-level UNGA meetings on tuberculosis and non-communicable disease that are scheduled for later this year. I guess the question is, where's the bandwidth to do two big global health topics, also in the context of uh, the three uh, goals that WHO is setting out as part of its global program of work? Um, on tuberculosis, Will there be a commitment to a specific goal? How does it fit with available funding? Are heads of state planning to attend? On NCDs, this is a, a check-in meeting. It's a biannual review of the earlier meeting. But the question is, what is the track record on follow-up from that first meeting? There are plenty of high-level commissions and commitments to ambitious goals. Uh, it, late last year, a 45% reduction in premature mortality by 2030 was set in place. But what of the progress to date on goals and targets? Even in Europe, only two of the nine scorecard targets are on track to be met. So how will this next meeting be different from the previous meetings? How can we move that forward? Within these three sensible and blessedly simple buckets, the same WHO structure also sits underneath with a small added complication. The new leadership at WHO has increased. We now have three deputy director generals and 11 assistant director generals. How will they work together? What reforms are needed? Um, and on the positive side, the, the WHO budget is almost fully funded through 2019, which is not, um, that hasn't, historically has not been the case between assessed and voluntary contributions. But some functions like management are actually coming in much lower. So okay, polio is very well funded but management of the organization is at 50 and to 60% of what's required. Uh, same with the gender agenda. I think when we look at the composition of the funding going into the WHO budget, the US is still number one. Um, and Elisa Edelman from USAID, who's part of the delegation, will tell us a little bit about that. But the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is number two in the single largest source of money between assessed and voluntary contributions. Well, they don't, they don't contribute on assessed contributions, so they're just on the voluntary contribution side. I, the, the aspiration of WHO's leadership is to move to unearned money, which is great. And the question is, is that viable or not when most of your money is in those two sources, US, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation? How unearmarked can those sources get? We'll talk about that. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Tedros, who will give us a welcome. Thank you to him for providing a video welcome. And then we'll go to our panelists. You have their bios. And I'll tell you uh, what their, their jobs are today when we get back on stage. Thank you. My sister Amanda, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, greetings from WHO. In less than a week, uh, health ministers and senior health officials from all over the world will descend on Geneva for the World Health Assembly, WHO's highest decision-making body. It's a special assembly for me because it's my first as Director General. But it's also a special assembly for WHO because we are asking our member states to approve the 13th General Program of Work, our strategic plan uh, for the next five years. The GPW is all about making a difference where it matters most, and that's in countries. It's designed to help countries make progress towards the health targets in the Sustainable Development Goals. At its heart are three targets for the next five years. One billion more people enjoying the benefits of universal health coverage. 
1 billion more people better protected from health emergencies, 1 billion people enjoying better health and well-being. The triple billion targets are deliberately ambitious. They must be. To keep us accountable, we have built an impact framework into the GPW with a set of indicators to monitor progress. Of course, to fulfill our mission, WHO needs to change. So we are now in the early stages of a series of transformations to make WHO the organization the world it needs it to be. One of the most important transformations will be to strengthen our country offices so that they have the resources they need. The GPW is not the only issue being discussed at this year's assembly, but it is one item that will have the biggest impact on WHO's work, not only for the next five years, but for the long term. Thank you for your interest in WHO and the World Health Assembly. I encourage you to follow the webcast, and I hope we can count on your support as we work together to promote health, keep the world safe, and serve the vulnerable. I thank you. Gerald, who's the Director of Health Systems and Services at the Pan American Health Organization. Lois Pace, who's the Global Health Council's President and Executive Director. Rupa Dot, who's the Executive Director and Co-Founder of Women in Global Health. Uh, which is striving to bring greater global equality to global health leadership. Um, and Kate Dodson, who's the Vice President for Global Health Strategy at the UN Foundation. And finally, Lisa Edelman, who's a Foreign Service Health Officer and WHO Liaison at USAID and participating in the delegation next week. So with that, mm. I'm going to kick off a question to our panelists, a general one for all of you, and we'll start with Elisa. What do you see as the most important agenda item under consideration? What's at stake? What debate do you expect? What will change with the adoption of the GPW? What issues will make or break it? Great. Well, thank you, Amanda. Thank you so much for having me here today and for putting together such a great um, event. Um, I'm sure you won't be surprised when I start with referencing the general program of work. I think that's been you know, a key agenda item. It's been a topic of discussion that the US government has been highly engaged in. Um, we do remain encouraged by the emphasis on measurable goals and outcomes and impact throughout the GPW. Um, however, the aspirational plans versus the high-level financial estimate of, of $10.8 billion over five years, of course, I think will remain a key, key debate. This represents about $1.2 billion over the previous GPW, and consequently, while the strategy is promising, there will be discussion related to the feasibility of the proposal. Um, we're, we're excited about the, the focus on strengthening activities at the country level, um, as well as greater collaboration between WHO and the private sector. We do hope that Director General Tedros will make WHO inclusive of all global health stakeholders. Um, in we would caution against uh, incre an increased advocacy role for WHO, however, and um, think that WHO should focus on providing objective public health expertise grounded in evidence and science in response to member state requests. Um, and we're also optimistic that both the GPW and the UN reforms that you mentioned will improve efficiencies and operations for WHO in terms of optimizing resources and reinforcing a coordinated public health approach. Of course, beyond the GPW, there's a couple other, or there's many other items that we would prioritize, but just to, to highlight a couple of them, you mentioned TB. The TB agenda items are critical as we prepare for the UN General Assembly high-level meeting in September. Um, you know, there's been an increased international aware awareness on TB as the infectious disease responsible for most deaths worldwide. And we've been excited by the in incredible political momentum in the lead up to the high level meeting um, from the G20 meeting last July, where TB was mentioned as a significant contributor to antimicrobial resistance. Um, and then in December, the WHO Global Ministerial Conference in Moscow that brought together stakeholders from 118 countries, including 79 ministers of health. Um, so we do hope to see further articulation of plans moving towards the UN high-level meeting and discussion of the multi-sectoral accountability framework, um, and then, of course, ambitious but achievable targets set. Um, polio, you mentioned, is also another key uh, topic on the agenda. The WHO has made remarkable progress on po eliminating polio. The US government has invested um, more than $3 billion over, out of a global investment of $15 billion. And together, we've achieved 99.99% of a reduction in polio since 1988. 
Um, so we'll be definitely following um, the, the strategic action plan on polio transition and the post-certification strategy closely. We want to ensure that the budget and activities are well articulated, that the country transition plans are strong, and that the definition of eradication of polio is well understood and includes adequate planning for ending both wild and vaccine-derived polio. So those are just a couple of highlights I'll mention, but I'll stop there and give it your chance. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. James? So thank you, Amanda, and thank you for the invitation. Good morning, everyone. My name is James Fitzgerald. I'm the Director of Health Systems and Services at the Pan American Health Organization. Um, for those of you that don't know, um, the Pan American Health Organization is the regional office of the World Health Organization in the Americas. But we also have our other hat. Um, we are the institution of reference in public health in the inter-American system. And so we have also a separate constitution with all member states in the Americas participating in our governing bodies. Um, certainly for us, the GPW is probably the number one topic. It's a very important uh, reference document for the World Health Organization. It lays out the strategic vision of the organization for the next five years, um, commencing 19 through 23. And um, we have been very engaged, and the member states of our region have been very engaged in the, I suppose, preparatory meetings through the EB, the special session of the EB, in preparing this document. And in general, I would say there is a general buy-in uh, along the three uh, strategic lines of the, of the GPW. I think the devil is probably in the detail mm -hmm. in the sense of how we actually um, implement and how we ensure um, the level of uh, strategic coherence in terms of um, policy implementation in each of the three areas. The linkages that will uh, need to be established between emergencies, UHC, uh, healthy lives. I mean, they're, they're implicit and yet they're separate. And so this is going to be, I think, core to the discussion. Um, in the Americas in 2014, um, the Pan American Health Organization and the member states had a, um, a detailed and comprehensive discussion around what universal health coverage means to health systems that are based um, fundamentally on uh, constitutional rights to health. In many cases, 19 countries in the Americas have constitutional rights to health or legislative rights to health. Um, and countries that, in which democracy has very much been built um, out of, um, I suppose, in many cases, autocratic um, and or dictatorships where the, the principles of equity and solidarity are fundamental to, um, um, to health. And so what the member states said when the question was posed to them in 2014 on what universal health coverage means they essentially said that universal health coverage um, is important. Uh, it, it is, it's, it's essentially the inputs required to, to ensure health. But what is really neat is access, comprehensive access to integrated, comprehensive health services. Um, and so they adopted a strategy uh, calling on universal access to health and universal health coverage. So this, this is um, an issue that may come up as well um, within the region. Um, as the region moves into the uh, World Health Assembly, what is that balance between the principles that have been adopted in regional committees, such as um, the Pan American Health Organization, building on documents around universal access to health and universal health coverage, as opposed to universal health coverage? Um, when we get into discussion, perhaps a little bit later on metrics, and um, metrics are important, as the former DG said, you know, what gets measured gets done. And so if we limit ourselves to, um, I suppose, a vision of universal health coverage as being the cube where you balance um, financial protection against service provision against population coverage, that is probably limited. And so we need to be very careful also. And I think this is some of the issues that some of the member states will be looking. Um, other priority issues, the NCDs, is obviously extremely important for the region of the Americas. Um, it is now the number one um, burden of disease, probably number two or three in terms of um, mortality rates. Um, we have seen other high-level meetings. Um, unfortunately, the um, impact as of yet, as Amanda mentioned in her introductory remarks, has been limited. And so um, I think the member states also from power are looking to see what can really be done to move countries forward to ensure those commitments and to seek uh, support from WHO in the implementation um, of, of the NCD strategy. Um, apart from that, climate change is extremely important. Um, we have uh, 16 member states, small island member states. Um, some work has been done um, on the potential impact of climate change in the Caribbean. We've seen devastating
hurricane season last year. We're now entering the hurricane season uh, this year. The region is highly prone to earthquakes, um, and all these impact health and health and development. So this is a very important issue also for, for our member states. So I'll leave it out there. That, that is more or less the overview of what, what will be important, I think, moving forward for uh, PAHO member states. Okay, thanks, James. Lois, what about you? You who sit on a membership organization mm -hmm. of many US-based organizations that work in global health. Yeah, yeah, it's it's um it's hard to sort of capture all of our members' interests uh, in one sort of two three minute statement. We have about a hundred delegates joining us this year uh, from around the world, from about seventeen countries, um, representing a number uh, of health issues, a range of priorities. But I think overall, I want to echo what's already been said. Obviously, we're tracking the GPW as well, uh, and specifically how civil society can really assist in executing um, those goals uh, and, and some of what's been laid out in that program of work. I think it's going to be interesting to see how uh, non-state actors are brought in. We have already seen that uh, that Dr. Tedros and his team has really been open to receiving comments from civil society and other non-state actors, which has been very encouraging. Uh, and so I think, as you said, the devil is in the details in terms of how that moves forward, how we assist with implementation, evaluation, and accountability even something like um, kind of raising the profile of WHO and what it's trying to achieve. I think there are, there are a number of roles uh, that non-state actors can play in this space that haven't really been explored uh, to, to this date. And so I think it'll be really on all of us to identify a lot of those opportunities and put those forward um, for the people deliberating uh, in Geneva next week and beyond. So I'm ex actually really excited about that. Uh, some other issues uh, that I haven't heard mentioned yet, I mean, I, we are dealing with an outbreak right now, and global health security has really been prominent on the agenda at WHA the past few years, and I don't think this year will be any different. Uh, obviously, um, as Amanda, you said, there are a couple of agenda items, but I think a lot of people will be thinking and talking about current events with regards to how we respond, how that's going, what we do now that we're in the midst of another outbreak, um, how we can really look at the response real time and, and evaluate how this is different from you know, two, three years ago uh, and sort of what we can continue to change or how we can continue to evolve, uh, again, in sort of a multi-sector way. Uh, and then finally, I would say that um, the HLMs as a bucket is important to our community. And, I, and I'm, I say that for a reason. I mean, we at Global Health Council are interested in both of these meetings as neglected issues. And one of the things that we're doing is actually trying to broker conversations that talk about the common ground across NCDs and TB, the fact that they've both been these major um, burdens that have really lacked the attention and resources that are required. And so they represent together this opportunity to think differently about how we do approach healthy populations as outlined in the GPW. Uh, and I think there's some common ground that even those communities have been able to identify as they approach uh, their respective high-level meetings later this year. So happy to talk about that later, but um, I'll stop there in terms of what I see is um, important for our group. Of course, all the other issues that are that are in the agenda um, are things that people are tracking, whether that's polio transition, um, women, children, adolescents, health, um, and, and other issues across the board, uh, uh, vaccine and drug shortages. Uh, but I think those, um, those other agenda items will be sort of highlights for our community. Okay, great. Thank you, Lois. Mm -hmm. Kate, mm -hmm. uh, so you're at the United Nations Foundation. You're a co-host of this event. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about how you see the issues going forward. Uh, well, and I just I want to echo that I think the GPW is the key area, but at risk of being redundant to other speakers, I'll probably hone in a little bit more on, I think, the interplay of polio transition and the budgetary implications on WHO as it looks to move forward on this new general program of work. Mm -hmm. um, this is, you know, at the World Health Assembly last year, WHO put forward an initial paper around polio transition, which did get a lot of attention, sparked a lot of conversation. And a lot, of, a lot has moved in the past year on this agenda, but many would argue not enough. You know, 12 of the 16 tra polio transition priority countries have put forward transition plans. They're due by June, which means, A, we've not gotten all of them. And I think some are of varying quality. So as we think about the World Health Assembly next week, 
dealing with polio transition has multiple dynamics. One is the conversations that happen with health ministers and others where among these 16 priority countries and how to support those countries in um, fulfilling the goals of their transition plan and enhancing the quality where there are gaps and representing the kind of broad needs that are at stake and what are the what are the options for the future in transitioning. So that whole suite of conversation will happen in the margins, not in the official governing body discussions, but it's a really important milestone, I think, next week. The next is really around um, how GPEI chooses to play and engage as a partnership in polio transition and thinking about things like the post-certification strategy and how that might kind of play out over the course of the week as part of a broader uh, agenda that they have at GPI. And the third is WHO's role in particular. Um, and I think, Amanda, you referenced, and others, in, you referenced, Elise, the, the paper that's now out around polio transition that was put forward by the Secretariat is articulating a point of view, um, especially around the role that WHO would want to potentially play going forward in polio transition. And this is one of those first times where they're starting to articulate that. And then when you think about the budgetary implications, starting to think about how to cost that and the implications of that. So, you know, how will member states in a governing format react to see that in polio transition planning for WHO, there's an emphasis on enhancing the base budget and responsibility of the EPI program on immunization <clears throat> for taking on coordinated vaccine preventable disease surveillance, routine immunization strengthening, et cetera, those dimensions as a more significant driver for the EPI program going forward. In addition to, as you mentioned, the World Health Emergencies Program and the responsibilities there that would be focused more on outbreak preparedness, detection, and response capacities, both for polio, but also in, including after we get through cessation of wild virus transmission, but importantly also on um, uh, the kind of infrastructure that's been built, that's been used and deployed, as we've seen in DRC, as we saw in Nigeria in 2014, on Ebola and other uh, infectious disease of epidemic potential. So I think that dynamic in those different sets of conversations will be really interesting to follow next week. Thank you. That's, we'll come back to you on some of those issues. Okay, Rupa, how, how do you see the issues you've been pushing for a couple years now at assuring gender equality and global health. There was this Tokyo meeting last December yes. on U UHC that was not the most diverse thing I've ever seen. But how do you, <laughs> how do you see the progress? There's obviously a lot of important gains too. Uh, Dr. Tedros famously has uh, more than 50% of the top leadership is, is female. But how, how do you see the issues going forward? Their plans, are they adequately funded? Yeah, it's a great, great point. So I'm um, also not going to echo what's been said on this panel, but definitely GPW13 uh, from Women in Global Health's perspective, um, we're really glad to see that gender is a key component of that, um, particularly gender mainstreaming, uh, gender parity targets internally in the organization. So it's fantastic to see that within the program. Um, what we're really uh, keen to see is that making sure gender is finance. So there is commitment. There's commitment in the top leadership. But when you review the Human Resources Report, Organization-wide, the numbers are still 30 to 40 percent for senior leadership, so we still have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. um, the second main issue, particularly universal health coverage. Um, we were just talking about uh, universal health coverage here in D.C. at the spring meeting. Um, there was a UH a form, uh, UHC form that happened there, and again, similar issues. We are not seeing um, representation of women. Um, we're also not seeing the gender dimensions being discussed in universal health coverage um, adequately. So one of the really um, exciting things for women in global health, um, we've applied to join the UHC 2030 partnership and. Uh, Hopefully that'll be announced in a few few weeks time at World Health Assembly. Um, so definitely universal health coverage is a top issue, uh, particularly for 2019. Uh, there is a high level meeting, another a third high level meeting next year coming up and thinking about um, how are we going to um, really make advancement on that. Um, and then another really, really key issue is we're talking here about um, addressing health emergencies, uh, polio eradication, uh, or, or whether it is you know, climate change. At the end of the day, when we look at health, um, how we're going to be able to achieve these goals is really through the health workforce. Um, there's an estimated 40 million health workforce shortage by 2030, 18 million of that in LMIC countries. And out of every um, 10 health workers, seven are women. Um, so there's definitely a gender dimension 
to this. Um, there was a high-level uh, commission, particularly on this issue, that released an action plan. And we really hope this is discussed at the World Health Assembly. How do we uh, achieve the gender gap, um, particularly in the health workforce, and address those dimensions? Um, there will be an online consultation coming out of the Global Health Workforce Network um, at World Health Assembly particularly looking at the gender dimensions, and that's going to be something we hope all actors really engage on, um, provide input. Um, and, uh, and finally, I think one of the other things um, that's really exciting here about gender particularly is that uh, right before the World Health Assembly kicks off, um, the EMR region, the EMR region, is also having its regional director elections. Uh, for about 70 years now, um, EMRO has uh, never had a woman um, lead the lead that agency. So uh, for the first time in history, there are two women running for this election. Uh, it's been a bit neglected issue, um, but we hope to see a, a different story, uh, particularly in gender parity in that space. Yeah, that's an exciting. And also that uh, contest is in the public domain. Mm -hmm. The candidates are known, their CVs are listed. So it's a quite interesting um, innovation, I would say, and I hope that we see more of that going forward. Okay, let, let's do one more round and then we'll go to your questions and comments in the audience. So first, Elisa, tell us a little bit about U.S. concerns about the World Health Organization. What is, you mentioned that the U.S. is the number one funder. What is the exact size? How, you know, the WHO would like to see more unearmarked contributions. Is that even feasible to discuss in the context of the U.S. contribution? Thank you, good questions um, and tough questions. Um, you know, I guess I'll say that um, concerns and priorities, I think, are, are mixed up for us, but I'll just highlight a couple more beyond the ones that I already mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think others have mentioned here the health emergencies program, so that's something we'd flag and we're definitely involved in that. One of <coughs> WHO's most important functions, as we know, is to support preparedness efforts and coordinate responses to global health emergencies. So it's, it's crucial that Director General Tedros and his leadership team continue to pursue the organizational reform. You know, we're encouraged by the advancements made by WHO in this area, but there have been flagged areas for improvement, including the need for greater clarity of roles and responsibilities, strengthened communication, and adaption of business processes to more effectively respond to emergencies. So we do hope that WHO can better accomplish its core mission by achieving significant institutional efficiencies. Um, we're also closely tracking the discussion of the international health regulations as key to strengthening capacities to prevent, detect, and respond adequately to emergencies and the importance of the joint external evaluations. Um, we believe that the global strategic plan provides concrete steps for all member states to achieve results and make progress towards full compliance with IHR. Um, another key topic mentioned that we would just echo in terms of priority and concerns is the 2016 to 2030 global strategy for women's, children's, and adolescents' health. We do appreciate the unified global roadmap for advancing progress towards the ambitious 2030 goals. Um, however, we're alarmed that many countries are still not on track to achieving targets. So that's, that's a concern. And then the, the last thing I'll highlight on this point, you know, improving nutrition among mothers, infants, and young children, including exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months and continuing for two years or more with complementary feeding is another um, additional important public health priority for, for the U.S. Mm -hmm. So um, again, there's, there's plenty we could talk about. That's just sort of a highlight of some areas. In terms of the financial contribution question, mm -hmm. I mean, as many of you know, if not all of you, the, the WHO's program budget is financed through a mix of both assessed and voluntary contributions. And assessed contributions are calculated rel relative to a country's wealth and overall population. So the US government pays not only the largest assessed contribution, but we're also the largest voluntary donor across um, a number of different agencies. So more specifically to your question of how much do we pay in voluntary contribution, um, within WHO's 2016 to 2017 biennium budget, our voluntary amount was more than $670 million. Um, so speaking for USAID, um, we have clear systems in place to monitor outcomes. And I imagine that other government agencies would do the same, though I'm less familiar with the specifics in terms of how they track the results. So we do have processes for reporting on achievements and systems in place to ensure that certain priorities for us um, are tracked, including environmental screening and gender are taken into account. However, we do look forward to WHO's plans um, and talk in, in terms of value for money mm -hmm. um, and in terms of strengthening accountability. So mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, great. Thank you.
So James, you mentioned um, that some of the Latin American and Caribbean countries uh, are concerned about universal access and coverage uh, as a sort of distinguishing feature from the way that the goal is articulated in the GCW. What would that mean in terms of measurement? And could you sort of talk about what's happening on the measurement agenda for that first billion covered? Um, and then can I also ask you to reflect a little bit on the value for money issue and the guidance that, that WTO and PAHO give to countries in terms of the medicines lists and the guidelines. How are they going to help with that value from you know, getting the most for the, the UHC money that's out there? How, how would that all work? Okay. Um, okay, so let's take the, the first one, Amanda. So I, I think it's interesting to see how the region of the Americas has kind of coalesced around this principle that's um, central to the idea of universal health coverage is access. People need to have access and the barriers to any uh, health uh, system and indeed determinants of health need to be broken down. You need to have, you need to break down uh, barriers in terms of uh, financing, mm -hmm. um, geographical barriers, institutional barriers, cultural barriers. Um, and the discussion should be around that. I think sometimes there is a risk that the discussion around UHC gets into too much of issues around health insurance, mm -hmm. packages, ceilings, floors, mm -hmm. and there is the risk, I think, in, in, in global forums like this that we can go down to the lowest common denominator. Um, the, in the Pan American Health Organization, essentially all our member states except for one are now middle income, middle income countries. So they offer expansive um, services, um, it may be segmented, fragmented, but there is a, a comprehensive um, benefits mm -hmm. uh, offered to, to populations. And so the efforts that countries are making in terms of the region is really the continued expansion of those services, the expansion of health financing mm -hmm. uh, to this benchmark that the countries have set in terms of 6%, um, and then strengthening the governance and stewardship, you know, breaking down some of those uh, linkages uh, mm -hmm. that persist, um, the inequities that persist in terms of segmentation and fragmentation. So th I think that's where there was only. And how does that affect the metrics? Um, well, as you're aware, there's the Health Impact Framework. It's a very positive uh, initiative in the sense that now we're coming down from 160 indicators in the, in, in, in the program and plan budget down to 44. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's something uh, very positive. Um, but there has been some challenges in terms of, okay, that, these are the outcomes and out, outputs uh, that are being put out there, um, that are being discussed. But the, the methodologies to measure that, the methodologies to measure the billions is, is a real challenge. Um, if you just take the UHC, for example, much of the discussion has been around measuring services, services packages. Um, and so there is the risk that that does not address equity it does not address the comprehensiveness in which a health system has to uh, function. It can be a point in time measurement. Um, and even there has been discussion around the definitions of UHC within the metrics group that doesn't align either with the SDG or the, um, or the GPW uh, definitions. And so if we begin to shift the definitions, well then we're, we may be measuring something else. Mm -hmm. And so these are really very important discussions. And I think WHO is very aware of this. They have established a an expert reference group and a task force around that that will feed into the secretary, they'll provide guidance in, into this. Um, the health impact framework will not constitute, it's, it's on the GPW um, site, but it's not part of the core documents that are being discussed. Um, we'll see how that works out as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think the idea is that the secretaries will take these issues and then after um, after the uh, assembly then continue to work on the, on the measurement framework. But the measurement framework is, is really critical. If we want to reach those billions, the aspirational billions, I think then it's very important that we, that we try and pin that down. Um, specifically on the, on the cost effectiveness issue um, and the value for money, um, there has been considerable debate um, within Geneva over the last maybe eight or nine years around the linkages, as you mentioned in your opening commentary, um, between um, the processes by which medicines and health technologies are incorporated into programs and the recommendations that are issued through the clinical practice guidelines, 
vis-a-vis um, -vis then the, the practicability, the, the, the application of the essential medicines list, which is a core list of medicines that are recommended for member states to essentially save lives and improve the quality of life in, um, in health systems. Um, there, there is that constant challenge there. They, they did, uh, within Geneva, there was then the adoption of a resolution around uh, health technology assessment, and that followed, I think, movements within the regional committees on the same issue. Um, and so the challenge now that, that I think they have is to bring this together, um, mm -hmm. to, to look at how HTA um, is, is implemented within a country context and then can guide decisions also within the expert working groups within, within Geneva. Um, in terms of uh, what we have done in the region of the Americas, we had a very interesting discussion with our member states. They asked to discuss the issue of access to high-cost medicines mm -hmm. uh, two years ago. Um, in 2016. That was, um, that was an extremely interesting discussion, an extremely interesting debate, and a policy document was adopted that brought these things together. The selection processes, the incorporation of health technologies, the cost effectiveness, the pricing, the procurement, and then the utilization, the effective and rational use. So I think perhaps a more holistic approach is required to this, yeah, you know, exactly. um, where we just don't take it in terms of piecemeal approach, but we look at the broader uh, elements of it. And I know this process by which our member states led us through um, to arrive at this consensus document was, was extremely useful in terms of our technical support to member states. Mm -hmm. Do you expect something like that to happen at WHO? Maybe. Uh, watch the space, no? <laughs> watch the yeah. space. But I think you're right. I mean, if you see shortages here, uh, EML over here, a clinical guideline there, it's, it's, not, it's not coming together. And, and also it doesn't feed into the purchasing, even in the global health funding space. We have work on this coming up, by the way, so stay tuned. Okay, good, thank you. Um, Lois, yes. you mentioned the role of civil society in the formal processes and the potential role that civil society could play in helping WHO achieve its mission. Yep. What are some barriers that you see to that process now. Um, what, what could WHO do differently? I mean, traditionally they've been quite conservative, let's say, in yeah. allowing access for civil society, in making information uh, easily accessible, mm -hmm. being able to have input before countries begin discussing it as part of an official process. All of those things can happen <laughs> <laughs> in better ways. Um, I, I'd like to think that um, you know, to the extent that we are all still able to take advantage of being in official relations, those of us who have that status with WHO, I think that's still a good sign. So I still want to, um, I want to acknowledge that uh, and ensure that those of us who are thinking about pursuing that or who, who hold official status or official relations really leverage that as much as possible. We certainly push it uh, at Global Health Council and uh, have gotten, you know, have had some conversations with WHO about how best we can utilize um, our relationship with them. Um, but I think that's an evolving process. And I think uh, being under new leadership under Dr. Tedros, that presents yet another opportunity for us to explore our relationship with WHO and really see how best we can maximize that. Because you're right. I mean, I think especially not being in Geneva, it puts a lot of, uh, a lot of institutions or organizations at a disadvantage um, with really understanding how we could work together. Mm -hmm. um, so I think outlining, you know, from soup to nuts kind of what that looks like will be important for, not just for the leadership at WHO either, but the staff. I think the staff has also, has also been craving for a while how they can best partner with academia, NGOs, and other stakeholders, and maybe um, have felt a little hamstrung over mm -hmm. the years with regards to how that happens outside of like these huge uh, institutional partnerships. And that's another piece of it, right? What else can we do beyond official relations, which we all know is pretty, really quite cumbersome and not really a good fit if you're really trying to engage at the ground level? I know this is something that, that Kate's thinking about too, mm -hmm in her partnership with Results. Um, I know, you know they've been working on this task team around civil society engagement, and I'm really excited about the recommendations that come out of that process that really outline for a lot of us what the way forward could look like um, in terms of how WHO can best engage with non-state actors. And so I want to give credit to them and that effort in surveying the community. I think WHO has also recently had its own survey really asking us you know, what we think has worked and what hasn't. And I, I truly believe that they are being really thoughtful um, about this process and wanting to turn things around. Yeah. Will it happen this year? Probably not. It will take a little bit of time. These are, these are big, these are tough nuts to crack. Um, and it's, we've been operating in this way for a long time. So just like you were talking about some of the challenges internally to WHO, there's mm -hmm. some challenges to how they, they partner with others that will take yeah. time to turn around. 
but I'm hopeful. And what about the relationship with the with the funders of WHO and the governing bodies? Because yeah. that, you know, in some ways we're always focused on the secretariat and torturing them, yeah. but maybe we should be torturing <laughs> yeah. the donors, right? So, I mean, how much do we know about the agenda of some of the big funders as they go yeah. into these kinds of meetings? So that, is that a leverage point? Um, it's a question that we ask uh, mm -hmm. of the USG. We actually have a, a webinar today, this afternoon, <laughs> with, with folks from the US government to, mm -hmm. to talk and ask about that. Um, we, we have a relationship with the Gates Foundation, as do many of us mm -hmm. in this room, and, and we ask that question. We ask what, what they care about. I think that is important mm -hmm. um, to sort of shed some light onto everyone's interests mm -hmm. um, in this space. But I do think that's, that's the tension, right? Because when I look at this broad agenda of the GPW, you look at something like UHC, for example, and historically, the U.S. has given in very siloed ways, you know, across vertical programs. And so the question we're asking, and we're asking that among ourselves, but also of the U.S., well, how are you going to reconcile these types of investments with this broad UHC agenda? I think there is um, an earnest interest on their part in terms of how that gets figured out. But that's a question all member states need to be asking, and all of the advocates need to be posing that question to member states that are used to operating in that way, whether giving or receiving funding in that way. So that's, you know, really operationally, how we break that down is going to be very important because that tension is going to continue to play out in terms of this versus this. And Tedra's feeling it. We're all sort of seeing it. And maybe that's something that you're looking I at too. I think Kate should process. answer the question. Yes, exactly. <laughs> what would be the best case scenario? And I mean, if you think about, uh, WHO is also talking about a kind of replenishment process as we go into a season of replenishments of many concessional windows in global health, but also outside of global health. And, you know, as an external group, you might say, okay, actually World Bank IDA money is the best money for UHC. It's on budget. It's not your, mar you know, whatever. But that's not really how uh, the funding is structured at the moment. So mm -hmm. how, do, how do you see that challenge? I mean, especially when you look at the polio transition issues and just the large share of some basic public health programs that are covered by this item. Mm -hmm. What what's the plan? Do you do you see something concrete that you could point to right now? So the plan is in the works, yeah. which is good. Yeah. And I think Tedros is making a smart set of choices by thinking about the a five year strat strategic plan concurrent with a broader transformation agenda and reform agenda in addition to thinking about the resources needed so that it we're trying to avoid the kind of piecemeal and challenging approaches and instead kind of recreate a narrative of what success would look like in five years and that's a smart approach um, mm -hmm. and you know the executive board when doing the initial review of the gpw in january um, requested who to look at the financing and to develop an investment case for what it would mean to invest in the organization. Mm -hmm. It's the first time that WHO has been embarking on this process. And it's a really important contribution for the organization. And they've been working on it all spring. And they aim to release it in June, which is important. Mm -hmm. um, and you, know, you talk to folks in Geneva, and they argue, rightfully, that all this pressure is on WHO to be the global guardian for public health. But it has an annual operating budget that's the same as a mid-sized urban hospital yeah. in New York City. Yeah. And those two don't reconcile. And 20 years ago, the level of assessed contributions relative to WHO's overall budget was almost 50%, which meant a lot more budget fungibility and flexibility. The growth in voluntary contributions have been essential and good and important, especially in dealing with things like polio, which is mm -hmm. taking up that largest share. But that has come with consequences that we've all talked about, right? Mm -hmm. So how can WHO, and, and Margaret Chan tried this, tried this a year and a half ago. She yeah. tried a 10% increase in the assessed contributions, which had not moved in over a decade. And that's, you, you could argue that that's not really fair for an organization that every year when you go to the World Health Assembly is asked to do more and do more and do more and do more, but not offered the opportunity to do more with more resources. Mm -hmm. So this investment case, I think, is a really important opportunity. And WHO, it's incumbent on them to be more persuasive and articulate in the arguments around what 
additional resources will buy. Hopefully the investment case can sufficiently do that and make the case for why certain polio funding, GPI funding, which has made up such a large share of the budget, should be crosswalked to support EPI, should be mm -hmm. crosswalked to support the emergencies program, mm -hmm. and what more can be achieved. So there's a lot riding on this ability for WHO to articulate it. Importantly, and I think smartly, the staff there that have been working on this investment case have taken a country-driven approach. This is all this, the kind of core of the GPW is start with the needs of countries, have a tailored approach amongst WRs and country offices and WHO to increase the quality of capacity and technical assistance and support that's provided in different country contexts. So in designing this investment case, they've taken that mantra and taken that approach to try to really look at what are those cost drivers in different countries and then ladder it up to look at the enabling functions of the regional offices and then headquarters. That's the right approach to take when designing an investment case, I would argue. Uh, I think the key and most significant question to ask in this is, will all of this important work ultimately yield more resources? And mm -hmm. under what time frame is realistic to expect mm -hmm. that? I mean, we can all see the kind of imperative looking at the fact that although the World Health Emergencies Program is well-funded, not well-funded, is partially funded, mm -hmm and its kind of core operations, the Contingency Fund for Emergencies right now is only at about 10% of its goal. We've all come around this conversation countless times in the past three or four years about the need for investment and preparedness and rapid response, but we're not <laughs> stepping up to support those core functions amongst donors. So what more, there is an imperative that is, it's real and it's, Easily, easily rationalized for why certain elements of this should be invested in the future and probably are among the more kind of lower hanging fruit of what could be invested in the future. But, you know, will WHO have a replenishment? They're not talking about mm -hmm. a replenishment. Mm -hmm. What they're talking about is increasing the fungibility of resources and over time trying to um, articulate a, a more kind of comprehensive approach of why, first of all, first and foremost, Domestic resources for health need to be prioritized, need to be accelerated, targets need to be met that countries have set for themselves, and especially investing in kind of the, the backbone services like mm -hmm. primary health care and looking at the efficiency of spending there. The second is around development assistance for health overall, and that includes, you know, your chief advocates inside WHO encouraging robust replenishment of the global financing facility, of Gavi, of the Global Fund, et cetera. So that all has to be a part of the equation. We're not going to achieve the GPW without those elements, well-funded IDA, uh, as you mentioned. Um, but then an element of it is trying to make sure that WHO is increasing its own fungible resources, um, especially fungible resources, but even some earmarked resources. And Tedros has spent a lot of his time on that in his first year, and he's making some headway. He's focused on the BRICS. He's focused in the Middle East. He's trying, you know, there are constraints among certain sovereign donors for, you know, how allocations can be made against certain, you know, mm -hmm. legislative priorities or whatever it might be. There are other sovereign donors for whom those constraints are not as strongly felt. So are those the lower hanging fruit to try to tap additional flexible and fungible resources? Mm. And I think you, you made a good point about um, the philanthropic community uh, is, has historically under-resourced WHO, but rely a lot on WHO for all the work that it does. So can they step up to the plate more, I think, is, an, is an, the right question to ask. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a very challenging, I mean, I guess the big question is there are trade-offs between all these different kinds mm -hmm. of uses of funds, and it's the same donors at the table every time. So how is it that they should be thinking about allocating their resources among these different possible mm -hmm. uses? And I think that's an area, you know, the UK does these multilateral aid reviews and mm -hmm. have some notion on this. It would be interesting to see across the set of big WHO funders how WHO fares in those assessments and what is it that it suggests about how it needs to operate to be able to attract the size of money that they would like to see. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think some, one of the challenges is that there's the instinct and the inclination when you work in 
global health to have your primary outcome be life saved. And that is obviously why we're all in this game. But it is a much harder case for WHO in particular, given its normative technical functions, um, to make that case as persuasively as the global funder, Gavi or PEPFAR or whomever else it, you know, is, is asking for money. Um, and I think that's the, that's the rub, is trying to make sure that there's a focus on complementarity, mm -hmm. not a perception of conflict, that you invest a dollar in WHO, you save this person's life, but you invest a dollar in, this, in Gavi and you save this person, that person's life. Mm -hmm. And instead it has to be a both and, and it has to emphasize the complementarity. Maybe we have to make some heroic assumptions and give a life saved estimate to WHO in the same <laughs> way. You know, they're they're not buying product, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, that's that's a challenge, I think. Yep. As a think tank, I, I share their pain. <laughs> um, uh, Rupa, uh, what do you see as what what actions do you hope to see over the next six to twelve months in the gender equality space? Definitely. So, um, you know, it's been a very exciting year for gender equality, at, particularly in global health, but at the World Health Organization. Uh, Dr. Tadros made a commitment um, to being a gender transformative leader. We've seen that um, in his senior leadership team um, for the first time, really having that 60%, 67% to be exact in his senior leadership. Um, now, really thinking about what more can we do? Where, where are the gains needed? And one of the points that you said, Amanda, earlier is, um, you know, we're often putting the attention on the secretariat, what WHO needs to do. Um, so particularly at this assembly, we actually are asking the member states to really think about what they can do. Um, one of the activities Women in Global Health does at the assembly, we started this when we mm -hmm. launched our movement, um, is doing a count of the chief delegates. The chief delegates are uh, who heads the country delegation and how many of them are headed by men or women. Um, being a head a position has a, is a uh, position of a lot of influence. Uh, when we started the count, uh, it was just 23%. Um, we've seen a slight increase over the years, but now it's really time for the member states to do their part, um, have gender parity in their delegations, uh, hopefully also have chief delegates being um, women as well. So that's, that's part of it. Um, uh, the other aspect of it is when you look at the organization, um, especially on gender, it's been identified as a key priority issue, um, you know, particularly in the WHO CSO task team that um, UN Foundation and Results is chairing. Uh, without giving away too many details, it's one of the ones that the survey identified as a key priority from CSO perspective and um, widely in global health. But when you really look at financing and how gender is financed in the organization, it's not even a drop, I'd say, in the budget. Uh, 16 million. And when you compare that um, to some of the other more vertical issues, um, it's uh, one tenth the price. And so, how do we really expect to uh, achieve uh, gender targets in the organization, which for the first time are part of um, the GPW 13 in a significant way? Um, how do we uh, plan to achieve universal health coverage? Um, and we already mentioned the health workforce. So we really hope that financing and financing conversations um, are about also getting into that gender bucket. Um, some of the other things that um, are happening more broadly in the UN um, agency space, uh, you could say whether it is um, due to uh, societal-wide conversations about harassment, um, sexual harassment specifically. There's an aid, um, a hashtag aid um, to movement, um, uh, building on the Me Too, and then there's uh, also a starting um, global health Me Too movement, and mm -hmm. there's going to be conversations um, actually happening um, at the World Health Assembly uh, about this topic. So uh, this is an opportunity uh, for the Secretariat, but I'd say uh, beyond WHO, the Secretariat, but also the other UN agencies, mm -hmm. member states, uh, actually all of us in this room as global health actors. Um, so we really hope to see action on that. Mm -hmm. um, huge data gap, so there was talk about metrics. Gender data gap is still one of the largest. Data on harassment, um, really um, missing. We just did a review for the Gender Equity Hub, um, Women in Global Health, which looked at 160 articles that were provided and other submissions from gray literature. And what we noticed is um, while harassment is reported in the health workforce at higher numbers in high income countries, um, it's still happening in equal, if not more, in LMICs, but there's such a huge data gap on that. Um, so definitely we hope to see uh, visibility on, on particularly the workplace aspect of it. Um, and then um, finally, uh, another really exciting thing that's happening with the appointment of the senior advisor to the DG 
for gender and youth is that we're going to be seeing a lot more visibility of young people um, at the World Health Assembly. They're hosting a town hall, and I just think that it's always important to think about um, the current and future leaders and a really uh, you know, have that voice. Um, so in short, I would say for women in global health's perspective, we see an investment in gender equality, really key. Um, and that investment in global health is going to lead uh, to smarter global health. Okay. Great. Well, thank you for joining us. Now we have 20 minutes. So I go to you. Please say who you are, where you're from. My name is Jerry Hush. I'm a sociologist, and I have been a consultant to the UN system writ large for the last 25 years. But I spent a good 10 years in WHO in working on a lot of these organizational management issues. Mm -hmm. So I would like to give a sort of a caveat. I've worked for or under or around four different DGs. Mm -hmm. So this is not new. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and these high, beautiful statements that are made are what uh, sort of inspire people, and we all want to work for health. So I'm going to actually, if you don't mind, actually sort of ask two questions. The first is, I'd like to move up. I'd like this to be a discussion of global governance issues, because mm -hmm. WHO is not isolated within the UN system. And one of the key issues right now is the ability to align data and to be able to show the relationship of impact, let's say with UNAIDS and with all the other funds, programs, UNESCO, da -da, that sort of came up. So I would like to see, I know UNDP just signed a memorandum of understanding with WHO, but I would really like the discussion about WHO to be broadened because I think, especially in the US, people don't understand the UN system at all. <laughs> they really don't. Certainly don't understand WHO, except in Latin America, where it does um, form an important role. So that's one of the issues, is, is I think I'm asking, how do you th see anything different going on from this new strategic you know, outline in that sense? And the second is, what I've been hearing in the panel, and I really appreciate your areas of expertise, but I again want to broaden the discussion. There are some very new ways of looking at the way this kind of organization is run. It is not simply a systems issue, it's a complex systems mm -hmm. issue. And the complexity of the organization requires not only that we think about monitoring differently, but we change our frame of reference completely. There are multiple actors <laughs> simultaneously acting. <clears throat> so in that sense, I want to ask a question. Where do you see these new moves, for instance, in One Health? One Health is a very important new policy uh, and governance move. And the second is, when and how can the social determinants of health model be really, truly recognized as a core component? Okay, thanks. Let's take a couple more in the back row. And we'll go here to Ed. Good morning. My name is Ariana Childs Graham, uh, the director of the Primary Healthcare Initiative at PAI. Mm -hmm. um, predictably, I'm going to ask a question about primary health care. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that the GPW does is <coughs> positions primary health care as um, the main driver or at the center of um, achieving universal health coverage. Um, it, it was a rep while we've been hearing more about sort of that connection over the last couple of years, um, it, it was a little bit surprising. And certainly, WHO is putting a lot of political capital behind primary health care, the 40th anniversary of Alma-Ata. There's a draft declaration in the works linking to the high-level meeting on UHC um, at UNGA next year as well. So there's a lot of movement to talk about developing implementation plans, UNICEF and WHO working with country governments to develop implementation plans. But we're also hearing about the disconnect uh, among existing guidance, mm -hmm. thinking about um, cost efficiency, but not necessarily connecting that to health equity or access. When we're talking about the three billions, who are those billions? Um, I've heard a lot of talk about the bottom billion, which gets groans in some spaces, is championed in others. Um, so what are the things that you're looking for over the next week or so? As there's a technical briefing on primary health care, a number of different consultations happening, where can this go? Will this be sort of this beautiful aspirational change in vision? Um, are we able to convince the very vertical donors um, to get on board with something like strengthening primary health care systems? Um, and so looking more towards solutions than, than challenges and roadblocks. Thanks. OK. Ed and then Millie. Right here. Thanks. 
Uh, I'm Ed Almondar, formerly for the World Bank. I want to build a little bit further on the first question relating to governance and the position of WHO in the larger system. Uh, the, the institutional infrastructure of global health seems to become more and more complicated and more and more fragmented from year to year. Mm -hmm. WHO has this institutional mandate, which WHO staff continue to insist on in the face of the facts. And I'm beginning to hear some calls for some kind of a uh, 1944 equivalent of Bretton Woods in, in the field of global health. Uh, I think there was a piece in The Lancet on this not long ago, and I'd be interested in hearing reactions to that, particularly from the non-state actors. I recognize that the state actors here <laughs> are not in a position to talk about that yeah. now. Thank you. Excellent, excellent comment. And then we'll take uh, Nellie over here. Hi, Nellie Bristol with the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Kate, I just wanted to ask you, there's some concerns about the leadership with EPI at, at WHO in terms of both eradication and with transition for polio, and I was wondering if you could shine some light on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, those are, that's, let's pause there. I think this is a really great set of questions. So it's true. The funding flows have become even more fragmented, but they've also grown at the global level over time. But I guess we're in a little bit of a holding pattern in terms of the total amount. Um, what, you know, and there is, of course, there's a number of sort of uh, missives coming from the European governments together with the government of your choice in Sub-Saharan Africa <laughs> to call on the various entities to cooperate together and to have WHO in some kind of coordination or leadership role. How feasible is this? Do you see it happening? What exactly would it mean beyond more meetings? And maybe I'll ask Kate to answer and then I'll ask uh, Elisa Plus, Join in. <laughs> That's important. Um, we're calling it in our office the Merkel letter, the even Merkel though it's letter. not just yes. Angela Merkel. Uh -huh. um, but it's an important, it's an important kind of new juice into this system and way to answer this question. Um, and I want to kind of talk about two things with regards to global governance because this is what WHO is trying to embark on in this transformation agenda is nested in a broader set of reform agendas that the UN has overall under this new Secretary General. Among them, most central to WHO's interests is the UN Development System Reform Agenda, which is under active, has been under active negotiation among member states in New York since the Secretary General put out his initial reform paper in December. And they're looking at trying to kind of both identify different, produce a way to have differentiated UN response opportunities, technical assistance, capacities, et cetera, offered at country level, depending on the country contexts and what those what countries are asking for from the UN, but also streamline a lot of operational functions and authorities and mandates. And you know how that kind of works out over the course of the next couple of years, I think, has will will yield a lot of insight or a lot of interdependency with how successful WHO's own transformation agenda is. One of the most bold ambitions of the development system reform agenda is to take the UN resident coordinator accountability line away out of just the and reporting to the UNDP administrator and instead have a development system kind of reform coordination or a development system coordination function inside the executive office of the secretary general. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, that may help with the kind of com competition that has arisen and can arise um, around mandates and lines of authority that then results in a competition for resources and all sorts of things like that. You also may be able to provoke more operational streamlining and back office functions and other things that right now are sucking up a good amount of resource in the UN system at country level. When everyone has a different IT system and no one's IT system is interoperable with the others, then there's a lot of inefficiency and drag in the system, for instance. But if you can centrally, centralize and coordinate that. So how WHO can look at efficiencies in its own resource use, at country level especially, against the backdrop of that broader reform agenda, they're happening concurrently, which I think is 
helpful, but it's also then makes it hard for WHO to predict its own efficiency and its own footprint and its own look and feel in country offices to kind of get out ahead of their skis far faster than the UN development system reform process overall. But it's an important set of questions and I think that that's, I'm glad that folks raised it. Um, with regards to global health governance in particular and this letter that came out, I don't know if folks saw it, a week or so ago, 10 days ago, by the heads of state and government from Ghana, Germany, and Norway, it's, I read it initially as kind of a, you know, a plea for help, <laughs> help create coherence <laughs> yeah. in this ecosystem. Yeah. It's getting complicated. And, and a request for WHO to lead on that. Um, in convening the stakeholders around that, that both are that are either financing or do some sort of technical or normative service delivery function from a multilateral framework, and um, I think that's still being sorted how that could play out, how that plays out against the backdrop of WHO asking for its own resources. I think is is to be discussed, but um, you know, I think if you ask a lot of heads of agencies or heads of these multilateral institutions. Um, in private conversation, they recognize the incoherence of this. Right. Some blame their own governing bodies, but then if you almost, if you look up to that level, who's on the board of Gavi same Global guys. Fund? It's the yeah. same people, right? So that I think is where the rub is, is getting those same stakeholders that are mandating each institution have its own set of systems, equities, functions, et cetera, and creating incoherence. I think that's where it ultimately has to be solved. Now there was a previous attempt to do this that was called the H7, six, six whatever, I don't know. You know the other thing is we have too many meetings in our field. I think we should do something about that. But um, <laughs> there was this earlier effort and it just didn't go anywhere, at least mm -hmm. not to the public eye. Do you have any sense of why now would be different? The, the, the cynic in me would say because there weren't resources against it. Mm -hmm. okay. And cons this is some of the dilemma in how the global financing facility was established mm -hmm. was does it have sufficient resource to um, impel alignment? Yeah. And some would argue it didn't and that's why the H6 has struggled with kind of creating that coherence. And if I could dive in, I would say yeah. that particularly what's, um, you know, this question of how political should WHO be and um, the approach that uh, Dr. Tedros and his leadership, it's um, clearly about WHO being a political agency too. And I think some of these really key strategic moves of bringing alignment, addressing global governance, particularly in health, requires political leadership. So I think one of the other new ingredients um, is that WHO is really willing to take that type of leadership. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering yeah. too how much of this can happen. Sorry, did someone else want to chime in? <laughs> I'm, I'm just thinking, well, someone said they wanted non state actors to speak up, so I'm speaking up. <laughs> um, but how much of this really can be driven from the ground up, too? I mean, a lot of what we're talking about is this, yeah. are these top down yeah. solutions which yeah. really don't pan out necessarily. And, you know, maybe it's showing my bias, but people on the front lines see this every day, you know, whether they're sort of pushing paper and administering these grants and programs or actually trying to get the work done. But we, we see it across the health community with regards to people really <coughs> saying, look, I'm seeing a person, I'm not seeing all these different diseases, this person has needs and I'm trying to meet those needs collectively. And it's the same across the board with people who are really dealing with this every day. Um, I think I wanna come back to your One Health comics, I think that was important too, and this like, you know, social determinants, we're all, a lot of us in this room have backgrounds that really um, lend themselves to really thinking about global health and public health holistically, but that's not what we see in the work that we do, which is incredibly frustrating personally for me. Um, and and I, what I like about this GPW and what I do think is a bit different is that we are able to build on this SDG framework, how, whatever we think about that, right, in that whole process, but that's being highlighted. And what I, what I was going to say earlier when I was thinking about civil society engagement is I th still think there's an opportunity for us, as civil society at least, to think about who else we bring to the table to have these discussions about health from these other sectors and communities because it's put out there as this goal that we can reach to work more in a more collective way, but we don't see it happening at the institutional level. So to what degree can we be bringing in the climate folks and ensuring that they're a part of those discussions mm -hmm. on climate change and health at WHA and likewise attending their COP as health people? I don't know how much that's happening. I'd love to hear from other people to what degree it is, but I think we need more of that to really put the pressure on 
member states and UN, the UN system itself to get its act together. Because we, we can no longer tolerate this, frankly, right? Like we can't get our jobs done and thus can't best serve the people whose needs we're trying to meet. Well, the good news is with aid transition, you know, uh, let, let's, uh, I think it's really very useful to think about the Latin American countries mm -hmm. and PAHO as one vision of what WHO might become in terms of its service to the rest of the world. And I mean, one thing that I've noticed having worked most of my career in Latin America is that, you know, as the external funding becomes unnecessary, actually a technical agency can be more influential mm -hmm. in that space. So maybe I'll ask you to reflect on that and sure. also to think about um, the question of primary sure. health care and what role it plays in universal health coverage. As you say, many countries come to the table because they're being pressured from the high cost meds. <clears throat> how, do, how are countries coping with that trade off between investing in primary care versus expanding the set of things that they would like to cover for the population? Yeah, you're, you're right, Amanda. And I was, I was interested in your comment in the sense that you almost kind of uh, qualified by saying, except in Latin America and the Caribbean. And I think that that is actually one of the, and maybe Asia mm -hmm. as well. Um, and I think that's very interesting because if you look at the issue of global governance um, in global health, um, are we talking about governance in aid development, aid assistance, aid. or are we talking about global health governance, which is, could be argued, it goes well beyond that in terms of normative and, and the technical support function. And I think once, um, I think if we, if we really kind of look at how in Latin America, um, the GAVIs and the global funds, um, and to a lesser extent USAID, have, have kind of graduated out. It allows countries to, to really sit down and to think uh, within a, a safe space uh, without a, that external pressure to say, well, ABC now is my priority. Um, this is what I want. And I will come, come into an organization like the Pan American Health Organization and say, this is where we want to go. And, and I think that's very important because that external pressure with the funding is, is no longer there. Mm -hmm. They have to kind of, as a middle-income country, generate the resources that are required and, and kind of work mm -hmm. in, that, in that space. And so that's why we're very, we're, we are very um, emphatic on the role of, in order to have strong governance in global health, you need countries that themselves have strong governance in health. Mm -hmm. um, and until you have countries that have um, stewardship and governance within their own health system is very difficult for them to come to a body like WHO and say, ABC is good, DEF, no. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so they're, they're kind of pulled. Um, so that's very much why we would say that as part of the discussions around health systems, we really zone in on the issue around governance, stewardship, mm -hmm. regulation, um, because that really builds the capacity, I think, um, um, for them. Um, part of that, I would argue, is it's, it's very linked with the, with the primary health care um, uh, context in which we're in. It was well mentioned that we're now celebrating 40 years of Alma-Ata. If you look at that declaration of Alma-Ata, you could essentially translate it into the context of 2018. It talks about social justice, the right to the highest attainable standard in health, um, primary health care as a core um, basis of any health system. Um, and then it looks at the social determinants of health. It doesn't say social determinants of health, but it talks about other things in terms of social determinants of health. Um, for member states in the region, it's always been an extremely important issue. Unfortunately, we, you know, we arrived with uh, structural reform, selective primary health care, weakened governance, etc., and that can all be debated and argued. But I think um, uh, for, for PAHO, coming from the renewal process in, of primary health care in 2004, we would always say to any member state, you can never achieve universal access to health and universal health coverage without expanding and focusing and investing in primary health care. I was in a country recently um, in the region, and the minister said um, that he was very happy because he was increasing his health financing almost for primary health care to 10%. Mm. And I said to him, well, do you know, our target, what we say to countries is, it should be up to 30 to 40% mm -hmm. of your resources in primary health care because you, you, you can't ensure inclusion, um, community participation, um, primary health care services being organized and structured within healthcare networks unless you put the money where the need is. And so um, this is, I think, part of the investment case that we would like to see also WHO focusing on. The investment case has to be towards primary health care. We have commissioned um, a, a study, a, a report. We've launched a forum. 
Um, it's, on, it's called Universal Health um, within the 21st century. Um, uh, 40 years of alma mater, and we, we've been fortunate for, to have uh, former President Bachelet to, to convene that commission that will essentially look at the successes of primary health care within the context of the Americas and the challenges that move forward. As part of that, we commissioned some work. We went out to, to the region and we said, um, we, we kind of said to, to the academics within the region, where's the evidence? And we received 400 submissions for papers that will be published now within the Pan American Journal in two, two, two journals. Uh, so the evidence is there, there's, the enthusiasm is there. I think what we need to do is translate this now and link it very, very closely with the UHC agenda. Our director, uh, Carissa Etienne, will be talking on UHC and PHC um, in, in the technical briefing next week. Um, because for her, this is one of her passions. She was the ADG in health systems also. Um, at Geneva, so we will. We are firmly committed to the to the values, the principles, uh, and the strategy of primary health care as a means to achieve universal access to health. And but I think it's worth mentioning that even in Latin America, however many years after aid, primary health care is not a very large part of any public budget. So it's a big a challenge, and there are mm -hmm. lots of competing pressures at the top of the health system. Mm -hmm. And that is the UHC challenge. And I don't know how we'll capture that in any kind of measurement framework or how we'll think about that as we go through transition. But if you know the other side of middle income looks more like that, and it looks like that in China, and it looks like that in many countries mm -hmm. of the world. And so how do you, can you leapfrog that sort of inertial tendency to start responding in urban areas with the stuff that people are in the facilities asking for every day? by investing very proactively in PHC, or is that even politically feasible? I think these are, these are real challenges for every health system and a real challenge for the World Health Organization. So with that, I'll conclude our event. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks to our panelists for joining us and for your great comments, and lots to look forward to next week. Thanks. Thank you.